why did I, for example, become a Navy SEAL in the first place? You know, and this is kind of a running joke in, in the teams, and it's certainly through my friends. It's like, well, we're 22-year-old kids, or in some cases, 18-year-old kids, and yes, we're patriots, yes, we want to serve our country, um, but we also want to be badasses. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the show today. We drop great content each and every week, and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. Is there anything in particular that somebody who is looking under their hood should be looking for in order to figure out whether they're the Jeep or the Ferrari or notable pieces that can help them orient to a, a better lifestyle that's, that suits their needs. Yeah, the, so, so the, the, the process is highly subjective and introspective. Um, and so, and what I'll say about attributes is that attribute, we all, we all have all of the attributes. You know, the, the difference in each one of us are the levels to which we have each, right? So, if we take adaptability as an attribute, I might be, if, if one's low and 10's high, I might be a level eight on adaptability, which means when the world around me changes outside of my control, it's fairly easy for me to go with the flow and roll with it, right? Someone else might be a level three, which means when the same thing happens to them, it's difficult for them, right? Again, no judgment. Judging, judging where we fall on these attributes is like judging our hair color. There's nothing we can do, it's, it's useless. Um, <laughs> but but we, if we were to line all the attributes up on a wall, like dimmer switches, all of our switches would be on different levels and we'd have to figure that out. So, so that's number one is kind of figure out where you stand. And then it's gonna be about understanding how that fits into the context of your current life and your current goal set, right? Because the attributes required to do one thing are different than the attributes required to another. So the attributes required to be a, a Navy SEAL, that, that list is gonna, is gonna be different than the attributes required to be a stand-up comic or a teacher or a doctor, right? Um, and some attributes, if you're low on, it doesn't really matter because in the context of your goal, it's actually fine, right? So the stand-up comic, for example, doesn't need a lot of empathy, okay? It doesn't need to be high on the empathy scale. In fact, too much empathy might actually hurt a stand-up comic <laughs> because how are you supposed to find funny at a funeral if you're you have too empathetic, right? So, so, so if so, if a stand-up comic's in the stand-up comic world and says, "Oh, I'm a little low on empathy," it's like, okay, that's fine. I don't need to work on that. Um, but if the, if if on the on the other hand, someone says, "Yeah, I want to be I want to be a um, a surgeon," right? And so, um, so courage, in my mind, courage would have to be one of those ones you have a lot of because, gosh, I can't even imagine doing that. Um, then someone's going to need to work on that, or whatever it is, uh, adaptability or perseverance. So you name the attribute. Again, it's a subjective task. So I think every person needs to understand, A, where they stand, and then B, say, hey, what are my goals? And what, what's the, what are the niches which, within, within which I want to excel and succeed? And then how does that line up with what I'm coming to the table with? You know? And if there are gaps, then start working the gaps. That's great. And most importantly is putting yourself in a position to be challenged so you can see where these attributes lie. You're not going to find them or discover them eating Cheetos, binging on Netflix. That's right. In fact, and it's not something you're going to be able to look in the mirror and just guess. Uh, there was 138 folks in your hell week, if I remember correctly. And I'm sure every one of those guys going into it says, I got the attributes that it's going to take to get through this. And how many past we started 168 something like that and we graduated 38 yeah so and that's normal numbers i mean you're, you're talking about 11 percent 10 to 11 percent of, of of success rate so 89 to 90 percent attrition um because yeah yeah because these attributes are are the most visible and visceral uh, experientially during times of challenge and certainty and stress you can't sit across this is where this is where businesses and teams get it wrong because they assume sometimes that they can hire or they hire based on skills because skills are highly visible they're measurable you can you can score them you can put stats around them you can put them on resumes you can see but skills don't tell us how people behave in uncertainty and, and challenge and stress attributes do and so you can't sit across, and they're, because they're hidden, you can't sit across the, the, uh, the table from someone in, in an interview and assess how adaptable they are or how resilient they are. You just can't do it. It's experience that actually helps that vet out. Um, and, so, uh, and so it's important for us to understand that the, these experiences, and so here's the good news. Every single one of us if, as human beings has been through challenge, uncertainty, and stress. We all have, right? So we all have vignettes that we can look back on and start thinking about how we performed. And if we're honest with ourselves, we can say, you know what? 
I'm not very adaptable. <laughs> Adapting's hard for me, or I'm not very patient, or I'm not very resilient. That type of self introspect or that type of introspection and, and self-awareness allows someone to then say, okay, do I need to work on that? If someone wants to develop an attribute, they can do it. It just takes a lot of, it, it, it's different than learning a skill. You have to, it takes self-motivation, self-direction. It, it takes a willingness for that person to step into discomfort and uncertainty and challenge so they may develop it. Um, but that's the difference. And, and a quick back of the envelope test for the audience to determine whether or not it's a skill or an attribute is to ask the question or questions, can I teach it or can it be taught? Okay, if the answer is yes, it's probably a skill. If the answer is no, it's probably an attribute. The example would be AJ and Johnny, you say to me, Rich, I wanna learn how to shoot a gun, a pistol, and hit a bullseye every time. Well, I could take both of you out to the range and, and teach you how to do that within a couple hours. That's a skill. But if you say, Rich, we wanna be more patient, okay, I can't teach you patience, right? Both of you would have to go find, uh, you'd have to be self-motivate, self-direct, and then go find experiences and situations that test and tease and develop your patience. Whatever those are. So I don't know, you go to the grocery store and pick the longest line to stand in every time. I don't know what that is, or, or drive deliberately in traf traffic, but you have, to, you have to find them. I've worked with AJ long enough to know, and, and vice versa, that neither of us are stacked in the patience. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> we drop great content each and every week, and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. There's two viewpoints of this, right? There's this view that, okay, I understand the dimmer switches, and I don't need to change them. It's innate. It's who I am. And maybe I could find the better road for me to be on or those in our audience who are obsessed with performance and say, I wanna dial these switches to a 10. I don't wanna be dim in any of these areas. So how can we create in our own lives opportunities for us to develop these attributes and identify the areas that might not be worth developing? Because there's so many attributes in the book, right? And of course, there are members of our audience who want to be at a 10 on every one of them. And some of that time and energy spend is just not really helpful for them. So how do you differentiate and determine, oh, these are attributes that I want to continue to develop and work on. And you know what? I'm happy with where this is set. It's getting me results in my life and, and I can move on. Well, okay. So a couple of things there to unpack. First of all, the audience has to understand that, that it's, it's, it's impossible to be at a 10 on all of them. Right, it's just impossible, right? We can't, okay? The second thing is being a 10 on any of them is probably a bad thing. Too much of anything is probably a bad thing. I don't know, I mean, I'd have to really look and do some real thought on if there's any um, of these attributes that like having too much of is not a bad thing, right? Um, because even courage, I mean, too much courage, that means you're, 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 you're probably tipping into the, into the, um, zone where you are rushing in like a bulldog. I mean, you're not, you're not actually assessing risk properly, you know? So, um, so there's a balance there on all of these things. You want to, you want to have, I mean, the, the, the levels, you know, seven and eights are probably the good thing. And even things like narcissism, you want to kind of be in the mid range. You don't even, you know, you, you know, so, so first of all, yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to look for, uh, perfect tens on any of this stuff. Um, in terms of each individual and what they want to, uh, accomplish and what they want to kind of excel in, it, they have to add, they have to do the work. They have to actually ask themselves the questions. Okay, first of all, what are the where do I stand on these things? Okay, and that takes I can't tell them that, right? This is this is why you know. And so there's an assessment tool on the website, that is, and we put that on there. And I, I, I wanted to design it. And I wanted to put it on there for free so people could actually do it whenever they want it. But it, it's it'll it'll give you a, a kind of a score on where you stand on the grit attributes, the mental acuity attributes, and the and the drive attributes. And the idea behind the assessment is that when you take it, that you, you have to really kind of introspect quite a bit. You have to think about it as you answer the questions and, and really answer them honestly. And then even when you get your score, the score is going to be a, it, kind of a, a score in comparison to the data, the, the data pool that we got the data, right? So, so if you're a level eight on adaptability, you're a level eight as compared to this thousand group of people that we... So even those answers need to be kind of thought through and say, okay, how does this apply? Does this make sense to me? Um, this is this is a little bit different than some of the other tests out there, right? The strengths finders and the personality tests and stuff, which I love. I think those are great. Um, but a lot of those are designed for you to kind of input a bunch of question, uh, answers, 
and then they're going to tell you kind of who you are, <laughs> right? Um, th th this is my assessment tool and the attributes assessment tool is completely different because it's really, it's really designed for you to think about and figure out who you are, <laughs> you know, versus be right. told. Um, I can't tell you, I just can't tell you. It's, it's, and so, so, you know, for your audience members who are kind of highly motivated and really want to do the best they can, um, first it takes the introspection to say, okay, where do I stand? Then, okay, given the contexts of my goals, what are the ones that I need a preponderance of? And then based on those two lists, I say, okay, where am I, where am I really doing well? Okay, I'm on level eight on like, on like seven out of 10 of these things. These three though, I'm a little bit low. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actively work to develop these three, these, these three, right? And then develop them to the extent where they're, where they're kind of good. I mean, you're not gonna get, I don't think, I don't think, and again, I'm not a psychologist and I have to do this, you know, there's not a lot of research on this. I'm not sure you can get to a level of unconscious competence in an attribute that you're lower on. I think you're only gonna be able to get to a conscious competence where you're, you're okay at it, but you have to think about it every time. And in fact, it might also be somewhat contextual. So for example, if you are impatient and then you have kids, okay? And <laughs> you learn it and, and the kids in, inevitably teach you patience, right? Hopefully, because they're like, okay, I know how I can be patient. I've developed my patience with my kids. That doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be patient with other people's kids, <laughs> okay? I mean, so, so it can be somewhat contextual. Developing an attribute can be somewhat contextual. It needs, takes work and takes, takes effort. Um, and, so, and so just people have to understand that. There's always gonna be conscious thought involved and work that needs to be put in, and it's a highly introspective process. I love that. And you mentioned, uh, to go back a little bit, you mentioned narcissism as an attribute. And for as long as we've been doing this company and we've been in some very clinical settings and have interviewed uh, uh, psychologists and, and have, have been in this world, and narcissism takes on different roles and different, and depending on the company that you're speaking to. Where in a clinical setting, for the most part, uh, psychologists have always pushed narcissism into a place where you don't want to be narcissistic, you, you want to stay away from it, it's not a good attribute to have, and it's bad, bad, bad. And of course, I've been in other settings, and I think it's an entrepreneurship and certainly business, where people talk about the idea of adopting healthy narcissism or borrowing from from places that that probably don't have the the best social results, but personally they can get you into doing things that maybe you wouldn't been able to do if you didn't borrow this from the dark side. And narcissism seems to be uh, one of those and. You might need a bit of arrogance to, to be able to step in the arena knowing that you're about to get your ass kicked. Yeah. And narcissism is the same way. It's like, well, you have to have some sort of love for yourself and maybe even the delusion that goes with narcissism to put yourself in a place to be able to see victory or at least to be able to learn. Yeah, yeah, no, it's so true. And, and so I really, this is really one of the most interesting and fun sections for me to write about um, because I had to really do some introspection myself. Um, but let me let me separate a couple terms here because I'm really into semantics. If you get to know me, which I'm sure we'll keep in touch, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm really big in semantics, okay? So arrogance is different than narcissism. And and arrogance is really, if I, and I, I usually relate arrogance to confidence, okay? Confidence is I know I can do this. Arrogance is I'm better than you. Confidence is internally focused. Arrogance is externally expressed. Right, and that's different. That's a different category. Narcissism is the is the desire to stand out, to be noticed, to be recognized, to be adored. Okay, it's a desire more than it is uh, anything else. Um, and then, so what I did is I said to myself, okay, I'm going to get the DSM-5, which is the kind of the psychology bible, and <laughs> has all this. I'm going to I'm going to get I'm going to buy one of those things. I got it, and I start. I put turn to the page on narcissistic personality disorder, and I started reading. Okay, and in that in that. Um, <laughs> In that, uh, in the DSM-5, it'll lay out about nine different criteria, like nine sentences, they're kind of criteria. And it basically says, hey, if you, if, if the patient has five or more of these, then they, they have the, the disorder, the narcissistic personality disorder. So I started reading them and I said to myself, okay, well, as I read them, I was like, well, I certainly don't have five or more of these things. However, as I was reading each one, I wasn't necessarily saying, no, that's not me. <laughs> you know, I was saying, wait a second. Right. I, 
I can see myself. I've, I've sometimes thought what, that way, or I've sometimes thought that way. So, so then I'd say, okay, why did I, for example, become a Navy SEAL in the first place? You know, and this is kind of a running joke in, in the teams, and certainly through my friends. It's like, well, we're 22-year-old kids, or in some cases, 18-year-old kids, and yes, we're patriots. Yes, we want to serve our country, um, but we also want to be badasses, right? We want to do something that very few people can do or even can even accomplish. I mean, just it's just, it's it's the desire to stand out, right? And so yeah, so narcissism on a healthy level, when metabolized in a healthy way, is the is really the impetus of audacious goal setting. I mean, you know, what what makes someone want to be the famous rock star or the or the or the the, the top notch surgeon or the lawyer or the or the military person or the or the author, whatever that is, it's. It's that seed of narcissism. It's that seed of desire to stand out. And then I actually said, okay, let's back this up even more and talk about the neuroscience, okay? When we are infants and, uh, and getting paid attention to by our parents or others, we are getting hit, burst with three powerful chemicals. Dopamine, which is, this feels good, keep doing it. Serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter that says, hey, this is good, people like me. There's a, it's like a safety connection bond thing. And then the hormone oxytocin, which is the love chemical, the love hormone, okay? Uh, dis, uh, uh, um, exchange when you have physical, uh, uh, physical uh, touch and, uh, with other human beings, acts of kindness. We're getting all three of those when we're getting paid attention to. That doesn't change when we're adults, <laughs> okay? When we're getting paid attention to and adored, we're actually getting the same chemical response. I would offer that um, every single human being at some point in their lives wants to feel special, feel adored, stand out, be, new, be unique, okay? Um, whatever that definition takes on, whatever that, that, mean, that meaning is. So I think narcissism healthily metabolized can actually, um, can actually be a driver towards goals and audacious goal setting. I think that's why we have to look at it. One caveat though, which I have to say, okay, because it can, narcissism when tipped to the wrong level, okay, too much, is dangerous, okay? Um, and it's also dangerous, dangerous for a couple of reasons. Obviously, we know it's dangerous because it's, it, it makes people, you know, bad, right? But it's also dangerous because it's like a vampire staring in the mirror. We can't see it in ourselves, all right? So the inoculation to that is to surround ourselves with people who actually tell us the truth and love us and care about us enough to keep us reined in and don't put us at the center of attention all the time, right? But, you know, the, the true narcissist you'll see, you can tell true narcissists because they will, they surround themselves with sycophants, right? They are always the center of attention, okay? If you have a group, of, if you have a friend group, a family group that keeps you humble, I call them your grounding wires, right? That's, a, that's an inoculation that allows people to achieve audacious goals. Think about the, the most famous people on the planet, either, either currently or in history, throughout history, who are also stable, okay? It's usually because when they talk about their family, <laughs> it's because they have a family environment that keeps them that way, you know, and they always go back to that home base to keep them stable, to keep them grounded. That's what's the, that's the inoculation against, against uh, too much narcissism.